to Retro Retro Enjoy your voyage. Voyage. And welcome to Retro Groove. I'm Adam. And I'm Liam. And this is a podcast where we talk about music that stands the test of time, the albums and artists that have shaped and reshaped the sonic landscape, as well as covering new music from those artists. Welcome, welcome to episode 23 of Retro Groove. And uh, we are welcoming, uh, well, we didn't really uh, miss any time with you as far as our listeners are concerned, Liam, but um, you're coming back to the States from some time in Scotland. What was that like? Uh, yeah, it was cool. Um, it was kind of a trip to be traveling outside the country after not doing that, obviously, for quite some time. Yeah. Um, and we had a, had a stopover in Iceland, and we were like, oh, maybe Whoa. we should just like... We should just stayed in Iceland. I mean, we were there in the airport for like two hours, but things were kind of cool. We were looking outside when we landed and took off. We were looking around and we were like, "All right, like maybe we should have just like stayed here, stayed I mean, in Scotland's Iceland." Be great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like we could have just done this and then we'd be there. It'd take um, another week off. Yeah, it was it was fun. Uh, the driving over there is a trip. Um, I'd done it in Ireland, and so like tried picking it back up again my wife got into it a little bit more this time and i was happy to let her take the reins but it was fun um the one bummer is like i didn't really get to hit like the timing never worked out and the locations that we were at i didn't get to hit like game and record stores i Uh, saw them yeah like i i walked past them but like they were always closed and shuttered i mean i think the people there they shut down their business at five o'clock you're not like Oh, wow. 10 o'clock mm. stores or whatever mm-hmm. uh, in a lot I of mean, those that makes places. Sense. Yeah. And so like I saw an HMV, which is basically like an FYE here. So yeah. it's like not nothing super exciting. It's probably actually more like a Newbury Comics. I think it's a little cooler than an FYE. Sorry, FYE. Yeah, I um, actually ordered my, um, my Radiohead album uh, from them, the Kid A Amnesia. Uh, oh, right. The red copy. Yeah, I actually that ordered that. That was through HMV? Yep. Mm-hmm. Oh, because cool. this, I wanted to pre-order it to make sure I got it, and we didn't know if a, a variant was coming to the states. Right. So I was like, "It's eh, insignificantly more expensive. I'm just going to go ahead and order from them and take my chances." And um, the shipping was very, very quick, and I was very happy. So yeah, yeah so I've actually purchased from them before. Um. The one thing that flummoxed me the entire time, and it's going to be a weird thing. Uh, so I'll ask both of you guys: What are, do you either of you have histories with hot tubs? Have you are you hot tub people? Have you ever used oh, hot yeah. tubs? Seth, you've used hot tubs. Lo- love a good hot tub. Do you have a hot tub? I do not have a hot tub, but I, I've okay. been in several. <laughs> okay, were they? Adam, are you a tubber? No. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. You don't tub. For some I've reason, they tubbed. make me uncomfortable. <laughs> right. Uh, I, I, I feel that. I've never had a hot tub. It's apparently a thing, especially in like colder climbs and mm. in that area or whatever. A lot of these places had hot tubs, including this one. Um, but it was wood-fired. And oh. my, mm. my wife was like you, uh, Adam, where she was like, yeah, I mean, I don't care about this thing, whatever. And yeah. <laughs> I was ambivalent about it, but my seven-year-old daughter was like, this is the coolest thing ever. We have to get in this. <laughs> yeah. And we were like running around and doing stuff, and I figured like you flick a switch, you light a fire, or whatever. It took me the entire outing that we were there. I finally got the hot tub, like had the time. It took me three hours to get it up <laughs> to like – 
85 degrees, which is not a hot tub. That's just a bath, right? Oh, so you had to and, do the work to like get the fire oh going. And, oh, oh man. yeah. And like keep the fire going for three hours to get it to like something like bath water. And so my wife came out and she tried to get in and she's like, no way, dude. Like, Cause it's not, it's not even connected to the house. Like you got to go across the lawn and it's oh, 50 degrees. Yep. So, but my daughter was like bent on it. She was like, have to cannot leave here without using the hot tub so she gets out there she's in the 82 degree hot tub warm tub whatever and <laughs> <Long> like tub <laughs> and i'm like standing out there like i can't leave her like, right I, so i'm standing there in like the gray skied windy <laughs> farmland <laughs> well, my kid, and she also, she thinks it's like a pool, and it's right. not a pool, right? No. She's like, oh my God, this is so fun. And I'm like, you can't move. It's yeah. weird. You can, you're supposed to just relax. Like, around, that's not what yeah. This is. Oh, yeah. She's just like, what toys do we have? <laughs> None. <laughs> um, so, so I stood out in the cold with her for like 15 or 20 minutes until A, she got it out of her system, and then B, I think she felt comfortable enough to be like, I did it. Yeah. And then it came to that realization, which, Seth, I'd love some sort of tip or insight for future. Like, what do you do when you get out? Because she didn't want to get out because it was freezing and she had to go yeah. back to the house. <laughs> you, you, I'm assuming you prepare like a robe or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You have a robe or a towel or something like that. I mean, granted, I've never been, you know, in the Scotland farmland, you know, uh, <laughs> sure. you know, ways away from the house or whatever, having to make a trek. But, um, but yeah, you have like a little, a uh, little towel, dry yourself off a bit, put a robe on, whatever, you know, but your situations, your situations, it's been like, get out and you can get inside real quick. Yes. That's the thing. Yes, ah, okay. definitely. See, I feel like definitely. that is the way to go. That's yeah. the key. Yeah. That's the key. Um, but no, otherwise I'm, I'm cool. I think my main thing was, uh, like, Dates and times have gotten very fluid. I screwed up a thing mm. where I was going to go to a concert the other day and then totally had the day wrong. Oh, um, no. Oh, no. <laughs> but it, it worked out in my favor the other day because when my wife booked this trip, I was like, ah, oh, man, I'm going to miss Record Store Day. And oh. we came back and landed, and I woke up Saturday morning because we did like a Friday flight so we would have the weekend to maybe feel better. Mm -hmm. Um woke up Saturday morning and I'm like on my phone and I see a bunch of posts and I'm like, Oh, I didn't miss it. Oh, <laughs> today. It's like today. Scrooge yeah, at like the that. end of a Christmas this is story. So cool. like, like I, yeah, <laughs> they did it on one night. How'd they do that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I like, I turned to her that morning over breakfast and I was like, I mean, I'm going to go. Is that cool? And she was, yeah. So wound up, uh, wound up going. It's great. Very nice, very nice. And you'll have to tell us about your record store day experience. And yeah, it was good. <clears throat> I should have introduced Seth earlier. And then we got to start yeah, sorry. talking about Liam's trip. No, I asked. Hey, it's, all, it's all good. Yeah. Um, but today with us on on the podcast, we have Seth Sturgill from the All N Podcast, and uh, hey. very very excited to have him on. Uh, we're going to be Dude, doing. I'm, I'm... Uh, oh, we're excited. Very excited. I am so stoked, you guys. Like, first of all, yeah, thank you guys for having me back. The The topic, the B-side tonight, it's, uh, th th this is something I've wanted to talk about on a podcast for, uh, s since I became a fan of Porter Robinson, I, I have never been able to um, talk about this artist. One of my passions, one of my favorite, you know, artists today, certainly in modern music, Um and I've never been able to talk about him in the capacity that I'll be able to tonight. I'm so stoked. Yeah. And that's that's why we were adamant about having you on, just because that's kind of what we pride ourselves on with yeah, man. Retro Groove. It's like, you know, we don't talk in, uh, we don't talk about anything that we don't, you know, feel strongly about or have you know, a deep appreciation for. And so when something kind of comes across our laps where it's like, you know, man, Seth loves this artist, like loves this yeah. artist. And I know nothing. And that, that always excites me when somebody that I've already kind of established, okay, like our, values and what we appreciate out of certain types of media when that lines up it's like you find a kindred spirit yeah. and then when you find out that they are like all in on something that you've never heard of it's like whoa i have got to figure this thing out 
So yeah, go, going all in is part of my brand, Adam. After exactly. All. <laughs> there it is. There it is. That's it. <laughs> and um, well, since you know we previously had a, a segment called uh, "Expand My Mind," but and mm-hmm. that was a little bit more centered on you know something that we were either a little bit cold on or um, didn't quite get it, even though we had exposure to it. Um, so Liam and I did that back and forth for each other with the Radiohead episode and then uh, conversely with the Doors episode. So this one we're going to do a little bit differently because, uh, and I don't want to speak for Liam necessarily, but I had basically, until until you started talking about Porter, I had basically yeah. not even heard the name before. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I, we're really excited about that. Yes, minimal knowledge about him, like a handful of things here or there, but but very little that I know about him. So. Are you guys into EDM at all? Are you guys EDM fans? A little bit. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, for me, there's been a handful of moments where I feel like I dip my toe into the pool. There was that moment uh, when Girl Talk really blew up. Sure. And. Yeah. I, that was just like that was such a cool thing, and but part of that, and again, we don't need to get into it now, but part of that was just going in and trying to. It was like a Where's Waldo puzzle for me. Oh, where sure, it's like you're, sure. You're going, you're listening, and it's like you know that there's 80 samples in each song or something, and right. you're like. Is that the Ozzy or like what is that? I don't know where. Where did he pull that from? It's Billy Squire, isn't it? I can hear it. Yeah, it's it's yeah. always Billy Squire. It's always Billy Squire. Yeah. Um. So so yeah. So there's been moments when I, I mean I had a I've had some Skrillex moments too. Like I've sure. I, like I there was that dubstep era. My my daughter just today asked if I could put on the song that sounds like uh, an electric elephant. Um, and that, that means bangerang, like the, like that, there's a moment in that song (laughs) where like he cranks something and goes, and so, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We're just like, it sounds like a, a, like a Mega Man elephant boss. Yeah. (laughs) yeah. Um, so I've had moments, I've seen a bunch of live EDM here and there that we will talk about. Um, but never had Porter experiences. So I'm, I'm very interested in this one. Yeah. Yes. Especially because it brings in just the emotional aspect and the emotional impact of music. Mm. One of my things, and whenever I do connect with electronic music in, in any way, it has to be something that like makes me feel feelings. You know what I mean? Like, yes, I listened to the new, um, crystal method album. It was fun and I enjoyed it. It was a trip, but no pun intended, but it was like not something that I connected with on an emotional level. So it was cool. I listened to it once or twice and then I, I can't really see myself with as much as there is out there to listen to that does like tug on my heart. I can't see myself really going back into it. So yeah, anything that, um, stuff like the avalanches, um, really, really deeply affected me. So I, you know, if I had to point to electronic artists, and sample based artists that that really hit home for me. It's something like the Avalanches, um, early Chemical Brothers, a little bit. Uh, so that's really what I was more gravitating to. So some somebody like Porter, who is definitely more leaning into you know the emotional side of music and the impact that it can have um, on a on a deeper level, then I'm I'm a hundred percent for it. I'm like, man, I, yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up. That that emotional connection because mm-hmm. that is going to come heavily into play uh, mm-hmm. when talking about Porter. So I'm really glad awesome. you you uh, brought that up. Well, I'm excited about it. Um, we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. We do. Yes. Like, I mean, we've already like, it's like, we don't have to really break the ice because we're all just so used to kind of just hanging out and, and talking about out. this kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, we're all, we're all in the, we're all in the podcast hot tub guys. Yeah. That's, that's, that's it. it. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> Retrologic's got the community tub. couch. Retro groove has the community yeah. hot tub. Great. Yeah, I don't think go. we're, you know, yeah. it's not community, but you know, whatever we'll, we'll be in the retro groove hot tub. We, sure clean, we, can... we clean and drain it every time. Okay. It's good. Yes. Fresh, yeah. Yes. As long as there's like, because a lot of times you have the hot tub that's like right next to the pool, so you can still kind of like, so like right. I'll be in the pool 
And if you know, we'll 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 just deal with it. Well, Liam just spent like three hours lighting this thing, so we need <laughs> that's to right. No, we got you have to <laughs> use it now, guys. Yeah, it's like oh, okay, it's like midnight. Right. It's yeah, like, oh, the lukewarm pool Gross. sounds good. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, so Liam went to record store day. Did you did. end up buying anything at record store day? What are we buying I and did. listening to? So I did, and the crazy thing is, so again, I didn't think I was going. I had an idea of what was coming out. Between not thinking I was going and my past experiences at the record store day, I was like, meh, I'm not going to even get my hopes up for anything. Because mm-hmm. I was like, that stuff, like, there was a dude, I saw the, the post that I saw that reminded me that I hadn't missed it, was of the record store that, like, the owner was locking up and there was a guy camped out. Already, already waiting. For, oh, already God, waiting wow. there. And I'm like, he closed up shot, like, he left at 10 o'clock at night, the guy was there. Um, and they didn't, they opened early at like 6 a.m. the next day. So that guy slept there, you know? Yep. Um, and I like, I don't know what for, like Taylor Swift vinyl maybe? Like, because the, <laughs> I don't cause they it. were hard to find. There was like a limited run thing she did because she was the ambassador this year. But then, right. so you're just, you're just like, you're staying there to be a scalper. I mean, that's a crazy, uh, anyway. So pleasantly surprised. I get there. I do my like 10, 30, 11 a.m. roll in. The store's been open for four or five hours. It's kind of like there's people there. It's buzzing, but it's not a crazy There's not a line huge line, right? Yeah, like wrapped around the store. Um, and I'm like plucking the two things that I wanted off the shelves. And there was like one or two of them left. It wasn't like there was a whole stack, but it wasn't like the last one either. Nice. Um, so yeah, so there's this guy, Rex Orange County, who um, he had a song or two that that popped maybe two or three years ago. Um, he's in that like odd future realm, but he's very, he's like a singer songwriter kind of, Mm. version of that mentality so he's not a rapper he works with some rappers but he does like he's got like a yacht rocky vibe sometimes or it's just like just he's almost got like a randy newman vibe to him sometimes you know he's like (laughs) it's so weird but he's just like this young guy he's this young guy i saw him at radio city it must have been almost three years ago and do when i tell you like so i was 35 at the time I felt uncomfortable because I was legitimately surrounded by like 21 year old women. It was just like <laughs> Radio City was wall to wall sweat, you know? Like he, they loved this dude. And I was feeling it too. I was really into it. Um, so, anyway, so uh, the album before he broke was this uh, album called uh, Apricot Princess. It was, the, I think this was the first time it was pressed on vinyl. Um, it was like some anniversary pressing or something like that. So, mm-hmm. uh, so I snagged that. I'd never owned that before. I have his other stuff, uh, his, his two recent albums, but I didn't have that. Nice. Um, and then the first pressing, uh, first ever pressing on vinyl of this EP that Childish Gambino had done with Jaden Smith. And again, I'm like, Gambino is going to be someone that even if I don't have fans in my neighborhood, they're going to, it's Donald Glover. Like they're going to grab that and sell it for a ton of money. He's super buzzy. He headlines festivals. Mm -hmm. It's Jaden Smith. It's a limited pressing or whatever. And like I said, I walked in and there were still three copies left. Nice. Um, so yeah, it's a cool EP. It's, it's cool. I haven't listened to it yet. Honestly, I just haven't had a chance, but, um, it's a sweet record. And then I did the thing that I've talked about a couple times where I was like, all right, I'm going to hit the new arrival stack because I keep finding cool stuff there. And I yeah. found a ZZ Top album that I knew like half of the songs on, but I'd, I've never owned this album. I think it's DeGuelo, DeGuelo. Um, I knew Cheap Sunglasses, you know, I'm Bad, I'm Nationwide. Like I've heard stuff on it before, right, right. but I've never, I've never had this album. Yeah, um, that's like the only one that I'm still after, actually. Ooh. I have like four or five of theirs. So good snag, because that's a, it's a great record. And it is the, um, you know, pre-transforming into the, the MTV ZZ Top. Um, that's the only album of that era that i don't have yet so i'm still on the lookout for that one that one's still on my wish list that's what i was gonna ask you because Mm -hmm. i feel like again so not to retread but like my dad is a massive zz top fan it's Mm -hmm. one of the few things that stuck in like his tastes to mine um but he liked and like 
always played some of the later stuff, like that Eliminator era stuff. So I don't have a bad taste in my mouth for it. It was then discovering what ZZ Top was before that, where I was like, oh, man, yeah. these guys were like gritty it's blues It's a different band, band right. almost. Yeah, <laughs> but, but I, I feel like you have this, you've talked about this aversion to the later stuff, or, or preference maybe for the earlier stuff. And so when I grabbed this album and I was looking at it, I was like, this is on the cusp. I did it think of you, is. and I was like, "Where would Adam? Like, what would Adam do here? Like, he so you would buy it because that's that's still yes. in that area era of like, I want to, yeah. I want to actually listen to it. Yes, and it's yeah. like, it's I don't it's not even necessarily an aversion. I'm not going to turn it off if it comes on the radio or something. But like, I just don't want I don't want to listen to it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, uh, but it, you know, that's the last ZZ Top album on my wish list. And I'll I'll get it eventually. So yeah, good snag, oh, man. <laughs> good snag. Um, and then if, listening to I mean I've been listening to a ton of stuff, but the one thing I wanted to call it: Have you guys? Have either of you seen the Sonic movies at all? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh the Sonic have two. You, oh yeah. Well, I just so <laughs> so my wife's out of town, and I was like, I got I got to keep my kid busy, like because <laughs> she's gonna get she's gonna get bummed and she's gonna freak out. And so I was like, we're doing this, we're doing that, and so I rented Sonic one yesterday oh and then nice we saw Son- perfect we saw sonic 2 in the theater just like a couple hours ago yeah we did too uh, nice. <laughs> we like just got yeah. back from seeing oh, it nice. <laughs> that's great um so the music in both of them obviously was great but like especially in the second one yes um so wait so both of you guys have seen sonic 2 oh yeah oh yeah. okay all right so lots of great classic hip-hop tracks right yeah like really cool classic hip-hop tracks and then there's that like throwdown dance battle dance to, up, off. <laughs> to Uptown Funk. Yes, yes. <laughs> and then there's in the like, Himalayas, by the way. In the Himalayas, yeah, or in <laughs> Siberia, yeah. And then um, there's like Hearts Barracuda at, uh, oh, yep. at the wedding, where mm-hmm. like everything's wedding. going down at the wedding, which is um, a great then, slow motion battle song for any movie. Such a but. yeah, yeah. <laughs> But then there's this <laughs> moment. So I'm already like, wow, this somebody, whatever music direction here, it's on point. Like yep. it was very cool. Um, and it reminds me of what like Guardians of the Galaxy try to do of totally. like pulling in those pop culture yeah. moments into this kind of nerd space that's also family friendly and everybody's loving it. But did you guys catch the Limp Biscuit burn? Mm-hmm. The, it was so Dr. Robotnik slams Knuckles by saying he's just about as as useless. Sorry for the spoiler, but just as about as useful as a backstage pass to Limp Biscuit. And I'm like, <laughs> see that? Dude, imagine Fred Durst sitting in the movie theater being like, come on. I feel like really. I feel Here like Fred, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like Fred Durst would laugh at that and legitimately yeah. appreciate it. Um, yeah, I think they all are. But that to me, at, I cracked up, and I think I was the only person in the theater that actually laughed at oh, that. Same. But who knew who Limp Bizkit even yeah, was? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Right. But right. I feel like that was. Pr- I feel that feels like a Jim Carrey. Ad-lib. I think so too. Ad-lib. That that yeah, must, totally. There's no way that was in the script. <laughs> I agree with you entirely. I f- I felt that way too. But it's like cool to keep that in. Yes. Right? <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, the theater. We went to a small theater. It it wasn't packed or anything. It was just a bunch of people. But um. But yeah, I, I felt like I was the only one. Like I that hit me, man. I thought it was <laughs> freaking hilarious. So funny. And it was like this nice cap on that blend of like classic sonic themes that keep getting woven in and then like jams that my kid like my kid loves barracuda she loves uptown funk like it was like she was vibing with it at seven years old i'm vibing with it with nostalgia like it was really well done i'm 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 pretty stoked on it i it's a great series hard agree hard agree yeah um what about you adam uh for me i um in typical fashion did not hit uh, record store day. Right. Um, <laughs> I just, me personally, it's my thing. I don't do like midnight releases for games or consoles. I don't, I don't do standing in long lines for things. Um, it's just not my, I don't like just standing around waiting. Mm-hmm. Um, there've been a couple, yeah, I don't yeah. do black Friday stuff. You know what I mean? Right. Um, and I'll occasionally like, I'll go to, 
check out the record store day stuff later in the day, like you kind of did or, or the next day. Um, there wasn't really anything this, uh, this time around that interested me to go see if I could snag it. Um, I did hit my record store, um, and I finally found in the wild a copy of Sports by Huey Lewis and the News, yeah, which a is one. a legitimately fantastic record, classic. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I finally have that. And I, I feel like I've been talking about these forever, but I did finally get um, a couple of records actually in my hands which is, I think I talked about the Lucius record last time, mm-hmm. their, their new so album. So good, though. I, uh, I finally got to spend some time with it. Yeah, yeah. it's really good. And, it, and yeah. it grows on you the more you listen to it as well. Uh, just a fantastic record. Um, and I finally, this is the album that I've been talking about for almost a year. I ordered it in June of 2021, and we finally got it due to all of the you know supply chain and and manufacturing mm-hmm. issues that the vinyl world has been experiencing and thankfully seems to be coming out of that um the stereo pressing of the lees of memories unnecessary evil which the lees of memory is essentially super drag um like minus you know a member or two and um there it, it leans heavy into the Beatles worship that super drag liked to do. Um, right. but even more so than super drag did. So if, if you're into, you know, the Beatles, anything psychedelic, it's, it's a, it's a cross between that and the power pop that super drag is famous for. And, uh, the stereo mix sounds amazing. You know, they did a lot of stuff in mono and, uh, it just sounds really, really good on my turntable. And you were waiting for that for a year? Almost. Yeah. Ordered yeah. it June of last year. So that's like uh, limited run games, man. Yeah. That's like, that's yeah, the first time like, I've yeah, experienced dude. that. So yeah. uh, I was happy to find Did you have remember it. it the whole time, though? Like, were you checking in? Did you ever have a moment where you were like, oh, yeah, that? I yeah, occasionally. That. And yeah. it was actually kind of cool. Um, I ordered it through, um, you know, through them directly. And or they went through um, whatever the distributor were, was, but it was mm-hmm. like you know it wasn't like I ordered it from a third party retailer, um, and so I messaged them through uh, Bandcamp. I was like, hey, I ordered this record. Um, it was originally set to release in like September or October, something like that, and then I actually got. Um, an email back directly from Brandon of super drag. And he was like, oh, wow. Yeah. He was like, Hey man, I just talked to John about this. John Davis of super drag. He was like, oh, we're so sorry. <laughs> like they're behind. Like, yeah, I know. I was like, they didn't have like some, you know, person on their team email. Literally one of the members of super drag emailed me back and was like really apologetic and was like, you know, they're, behind on the manufacturing it's looking like probably december now um and i was just like dude don't apologize oh my god i'm just <laughs> like <laughs> i felt bad because he he was like apologizing um so that was just like a fun little moment and yeah you know december turned into sometime in spring and that turned into finally um getting my hands on it so i've been I've, that and the lucius record are the only two things that have actually been on my turntable um well but that mm-hmm. harkens back to what you talked about a couple weeks ago with Bandcamp getting purchased by epic games like what an interesting example of you had this boutique hands-on connection with the artist that you're engaging with there and the fear that being absorbed by something like epic games could taint that nothing i mean look nothing's happened not yet hoping for the best exactly but you just never know with those acquisitions epic is so epic and like i wonder if people will have that experience that what you just described reminds me of like when you would buy a CD or something back in the day and it would have that little insert where you could mail away for a fan club or a a sticker or something like that. And you'd actually get a letter from maybe the band or maybe the band's representative or something. It was like a personal engagement thing, pen pal wise almost. Um, That's so crazy that they just emailed you. That's um, Yeah. that's, that's, (laughs) Yeah. You tapped into a little, I mean, that's their business. Yeah, that's their, 
Yeah. Yeah. I flagged so the email. So I have that forever. It's like my little digital <laughs> <laughs> autograph. That's, amazing. Yeah. That's so <laughs> um, cool. But other than that, like, you know, so the, those two things have been on my turntable, but <clears throat> in the car, so I'm just coming off of um, guesting on the On Topic Retro podcast um, doing yeah. their Toe Jam and Earl episode. Mm. Um, and, you know, that was was and is one of my favorite Sega Genesis games, top five for me, for sure. And um, so coming off of that and it being in my head, um, I popped on the Toe Jam and Earl Back in the Groove soundtrack. Um, yeah, it's so good. And it's, you know, a guy so by the name of Cody Wright. Yeah, and it's just... It's so fun. And it's like, I was able to just have it playing in the car and nobody told me to turn it off because it's mostly nice. instrumental and mm-hmm. it's just funky and fun and happy. And it's like, it's, it's just, it was so, such a vibe. I mean, I couldn't have been happier just, just having this f- retro sounding, you know, pseudo hip hop funk backdrop to whatever was going on while I was trying to run errands. And it just like put me in an incredibly good mood. So <clears throat> that uh, multiple times I've been listening to that in the past uh, week or two. Um, so the only thing in addition to that is somehow I missed like the first full length, uh, Krungbin album. Mm. Uh, I, I came on to them with their second album. And I, you know, that one sees regular play on my turntable and the newer stuff is good too. But this first album, the universe uh, smiles upon you is so good. And I mean, for the most part, you see an upward trajectory and I'm not saying that they did a downward trajectory, but that first Mm. album, you know, I, I would almost expect it to be like weaker than the rest and it's not it they just come out of the gate with this incredible album that is so unique in its approach and um it actually now has uh one of my favorite songs of theirs on it which i like just discovered which is crazy being a fan of them for so long uh the song white gloves and uh i just love it that's one song that i would put on and i would repeat the song four or five times i was so in love with it so hey man, I didn't even know this album existed. Me either. Right now. Like what the yeah. heck? Where did it come from? Yeah. It is looks it- like it might never have gotten cuz they signed to secretly for that for the what I thought Con was Toto their debut album, but it's yeah. not. Yeah. Um it looks like this might not have ever been reissued or something. I mean, it's not that old. It's 7 years old, but Well, I can't um, even find I'm going to pop up on Discogs again just to make sure, but I I looked mm-hmm. it up on Discogs. I don't actually see a U.S. pressing of it. I'm yeah. only seeing overseas pressings, yeah. and it, that's kind of a little bit odd well, because they're a Texas yeah. band. They, yeah, but the out the the label that it looks like their deals through is a European label. So it, it could have been that they got signed by that indie, and everything was focused over there, and they just didn't have a distributor in the U.S. But the band's blown up, and now to the now to the point where you'd think that they would i, What's I also would be crazy shocked is they if you do? don't see some th- pressing I, yeah. I would too but it's like so the album came out in like 2015 and they have had reissues they did a reissue in 2020 but it was still only out of the uk Weird. so yeah it's, it's so i don't know if they have some kind of exclusivity maybe uh but so you know i've got a uk copy on my wish list here and it's not terribly expensive. It sells for like, you know, 25, 30 bucks, which is, you you might pay that for something new that's not even particularly rare. So um, yeah. that's, that's definitely high on my priority list. Um, and I should have looked for it at HMV, man. <laughs> uh, you never know. Traveling with vinyl, though, I'd never, that was the other thing where I was like, if I got to go to a music store over there and then like pack vinyl home, like it's going to break. It's going to get all messed up. I can't. Yeah. And depending on the store, they'll ship it. I know a lot of my locals, um, they'll, you know, they even have like a sign in the front, like, you know, we'll ship for you or whatever. So, Mm. um, I guess that's, that's probably an option for, for most records, but then you get an additional expense on top of it. So it's like, exactly. Oh, well. 
So Seth, have um, you bought any yeah. albums lately or uh you listening to anything unique other than Porter Robinson? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well I mean Porter's been, you know, of heavy course. in my rotation for a long time, but you know, I've been kind of um living in this kind of ever since um you reached out to to do this episode, I kind of started just like immersing myself as I know you guys do too when you prepare for an episode, just kind of like listening to adjacent things or things relative to the artist. And I've kind of found myself here in the past few days, just kind of living in this like early to mid two thousands kind of hands up EDM kind of vibe, you Mm -hmm. know, listening to like bass hunter and, you know, like, um, uh, I, earlier today I just listened through, um, discovery by Daft Punk, which is like one of my favorite albums of all time, Mm -hmm. you know, um, just, just kind of like bump in this kind of like early two thousands, you know, EDM moment and, uh, and just sort of, yeah, just, just sort of living in it. And, and that stuff's involved a lot in, in, uh, in Porter's journey, obviously. And I, I actually, it was funny. Um, you guys are talking about, um, record store day. I wanted to, I was thinking about you guys when we did this. Um, on my show, All In, we do a top five every week. And we usually just kind of like a funny little like jab or whatever, just kind of like a dumb, like we'll, we'll be like, it's national, you know, pet day. So we're going to count down the top five pets in Nintendo (laughs) history, you know, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So for national record store day, we structured a top five around fictional bands in Nintendo games. Oh, nice. So, oh. And, and the way we framed it was we sort of set it up like it was like an all in music fest. So it was like awesome. our number five spot is for like the sound test bands, you know. Um, so it had like the the Deedle D's and the new Kirby game. It had um, the <laughs> Peach awesome. Hit 5 from Super Princess Peach in there, you know. And then you get into, you know, you go all the way up to having like off the hook from splatoon and like the duos nice. category you know so we we did like a whole i was thinking about you guys when we did that so i wanted to shout that that's out that's fun um yeah it was a, it was a really fun top five um but then i also kind of rediscovered this band so this is going to be a total just like early 2000s uh, moment right here that's, one of that's the bands <laughs> that i got really into when i was big into my like wow days um <laughs> just I would, I would just play wow and i listened to this sort of like not quite trance, kind of like a like a dark, almost emo EDM band called God Module. I don't oh. very oh. like. Apparently, they're still around. I didn't even know they were still around. Um, very kind of just like you know the the headspace I was in, just like you know, kid playing WoW, blasting this stuff over my speakers, right. you know, and and it just like I, I was just I, I kind of thought about them again and looked them up and sure enough they're still making music and it's not as good as when I was listening to them but you know I pulled up some of their old stuff and I'm just I don't know man I've just been in this kind of like you know flashback 20 years you That's know great. kind of vibe here lately and uh, listening to all this weird junk that I used to be really into when I was younger you know awesome wow so. yeah it's it is a trip we've talked about it before it is a trip to like go back and suddenly realize that that artist is still making music and somehow so you weird. guys diverged. Right. And then all of a sudden like, Oh yeah. Stabbing Westward. That's bizarre. They're still, <laughs> how's that? How's that even possible? They're still around. Um, yeah. Um, it's kind of like when you go back into like a town that you haven't visited for a while and you're like, Oh, the pizza place is th- still here and they're yeah. still making the pizza there. That's crazy. I got to go have a slice. Yeah. That was um, exactly what it was. Yeah. yeah that's so cool. And like, uh, no matter yeah. what, even if like objectively the music that they're making now is better, it's it's impossible for it to be as good as it was for you at mm-hmm. that particular right. age. When yeah, you're right. like high school, early college years, early twenties, it's like if it if something hits you at that point, that is the best that that artist is ever going to be able to do to affect you. (laughs) At least Mm -hmm. it seems that way. I'm generalizing of course, but um, yeah, when something hits you at that age, even if that band continues on, you're going to look back. Okay. Yeah. That was the era right there. (laughs) And it just, it just hits you at that right age. Um, Oh yeah. God God module has been putting out records almost every year, Seth. This is crazy. crazy. Well, EPs or something. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I I had no idea they were still around. It just totally I threw on some of the like so they they probably their most prolific album is this uh what one of the earlier ones called Viscera and um it, it that was kind of what I threw on and just sort of put you know put me back in that place all of a sudden I'm like fifteen three o'clock in the morning eating pizza rolls and playing World of Warcraft oh, you know man. what I mean and wow. just put me Mates. in that space <laughs> yeah totally. Looks like I gotta check this out. Were you listening to them? You were li- you would have that on while you were playing WoW. Is that what you said? Yeah, that would be. I would basically lower the game music to where I could yeah. like still hear it. I needed to hear like callouts and stuff for raids, and it would be like I would have my friends in my ear for on ventrilo. You know what I mean? And then like I would have the the music also in the background in my ear, kind of at a lower volume and just vibing. You were soundtracking <laughs> your game, like you were. Literally, you had yeah. yeah. That's so cool. So then, <laughs> do you have that phenomenon where now in your brain, if if you listen to any of that music, it puts yes. you like in that space where you were in the game? 1,000%. <laughs> That's 1, so crazy. And yes. it's, I think, and we may have even touched on this before, but like, it's in kind of insane how strong that connection is oh yeah like that associative memory yeah i can remember playing through sonic and knuckles you know to be topical we just saw sonic 2 but um and you know there were there were a couple albums that i was listening to heavy at the time but i would like turn the tv audio off and like crank up uh, a couple of different albums but one of them was smashing pumpkins so like anytime mm-hmm. that i listened to gish by smashing mm-hmm. pumpkins i'm transported to levels in sonic and knuckles that's amazing <laughs> that's a weird one for sonic so and knuckles that, too, like, although i could hear it yeah so if you like put on god module to listen to or whatever does it like put you back like in totally. northrend or like <laughs> yeah totally yeah yeah mo- mostly just like really hyper specific stuff like you know like all of a sudden it's a flashback i'm like i'm in i'm in black wing lair right now you know just like dumb That's stuff so like fun. that so crazy hyper specific i have another one like that too where um so i was heavy 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 into uh blink 182 and all of the various blink spinoff bands and mm-hmm. um i was actually living in alaska when plus 44 wow. put out their record oh my god um, i love that album it was so good and yeah. um that's I, travis I, and mark yes travis yeah. and mark kind of did you know because because tom did his tom angels and airwaves, angels and airwaves. And did yep. his thing and then and then travis and mark did their own thing and um and for me plus 44 is way better but yeah. um that's just a personal taste thing but but sure. so i think about that though whenever i listen to plus 44 i feel like i'm back in in alaska you know that's sitting crazy. in our apartment and that's you awesome. know totally yeah um, there was a game on the Nintendo 64 called Hybrid Heaven. It was a Konami game. It was like part RPG, mm-hmm. part fighting combat game where you like, it was turn based, but you were like fighting hand to hand, but there were aliens and robots. Um, <laughs> I've never and played be- it. I've heard of it though. It's a sleeper yeah, hit. And- I was so, so, so into this game. It was one of those first games when I had started reading Nintendo Power and they did previews for it. And I was like, this is the grown up, dark and moody game that I'm going to get into. And so I was like (laughs) hyped for it when it finally came out and it was all robots, aliens and fighting. I was like, Power Man 5000 hybrid heaven yeah. and so like <laughs> that works. i i like would turn the volume down on hybrid heaven and just listen to tonight the stars revolt on repeat and like <laughs> that's awesome there's a song called operate annihilate on that album which is such a banger for like that like night late 90s early 2000s new metal whatever uh-huh. it was um but yeah when i hear operate annihilate i'm like I'm fighting a mech, you know, I'm like, it (laughs) it takes me back, man. I love that. You usually only get that with smell, like smell will do that for you. But I guess music and sounds and stuff can give you that same kind of brain transportation. But it's weird because it doesn't seem, at least for me, like it doesn't necessarily have nearly as strong a connection as it does to like a a game specifically. Mm -hmm. Like, like the only one I can think of is I bought that first super drag record when I was, it was a CD at the time, of course, when I was on vacation with my parents in Myrtle beach, South Carolina. And so like the whole, you know, whatever two day road trip back to Massachusetts, I listened to that. So that'll connect for me. 
I'll, yeah. you know, when I listen to that record, I feel like I'm in the back of my parents' van on I-95. But yeah. really, there's not a whole lot of that for me other than video game connections. So there's got to mm-hmm. be something there. I don't know what it is. It's, yeah, brains I, are weird. I think you can, <laughs> yeah, you can enjoy a video game. I mean, obviously, and I feel like we could even get into this with the Porter conversation, but obviously, like, the, the soundtracking of many video games is so important. Yeah. But... You could you could soundtrack it yourself like we're talking about here and still have a unique and wonderful experience. Yeah. You can't really do that with a movie in most situations, no. right? Like video games are immersive enough in your engagement and the visual where you can tweak the audio and have a unique experience. I don't know. Totally. You can't do that with reading probably, right? You can't do that with movies or TV. So it's probably a unique situation. Seems to be it's because it's you yeah. know what it probably is is it's transportive, you know music yep. can completely transport you somewhere else, um, you know with a movie or a TV show and even with a book you're kind of a spectator to the story, mm-hmm. and with a game you're not you're part yeah. of it, and yeah, right. and then music being so transportive if the game is transporting you somewhere outside of this realm of existence entirely the music is just kind of along for the ride with you. So yeah. got to be something to do point. with that. But yeah. And it's yeah, probably different so. for other people. But <clears throat> anywho, we got, we got yeah. some news to talk about if we want to hit that. Yeah, let's dive into that real quick. Cool. Because um, cause then we're going to get all emo and, and talk about our, our <laughs> musical feelings some more on the Too other late. side anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, so one thing, a couple things I wanted to bring up. You know, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, we've done some stuff here about it. There's going to be some more uh, convos coming up as uh, as votes are tallied and such. But there's a thing where Dolly Parton, um, being Dolly and being wonderful, um, was kind of like, yeah, I don't. I don't think that I appreciate you guys nominating me. I don't think that she she said she hadn't earned the right. Um, but she was kind of like, this isn't for me, you know, and I, and she was feeling like it was going to screw up um, and like kind of taint the water for all mm. these other amazing artists. And so she was like, take me off the ballot, completely respect it. Thank you so much. But like, you guys wow. should do you guys should do your thing and 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 I'll I'll step out. She she said she wanted to bow out. They have not taken her off the ballot. And so she came out and she was like she's you know she's she's not going to fight it. Right. Like she's not going to she's not going to like some of the other artists who won and won't show up. She's like, <laughs> well, if you if you vote for me, of course I'll show up. But like please give it to these other artists. So it's just it could be setting up a really interesting thing. I, it's going to once again force that conversation of like, should they be letting more people in? Like, obviously you want to be inclusive and you want rock and roll to be this expansive subject. And so I'm not saying that Dolly doesn't fit, but like there are artists who haven't gotten in, like the MC5 and Judas Priest and and some others, where it's just like they really belong in there and like if she gets in and the new york dolls don't that is a bummer you know like it for the rock and roll hall of fame there are certain people that i think should be getting that look is that Um, what she meant by that like as a country artist she didn't think that it was her space or yeah i think Mm. she was just like yeah she didn't earn the right in the rock and roll space that she was flattered and grateful but like she she came right out and she was like Mm. i don't want votes to be split because of me she's she spelled that out she was just like i don't want to screw up the voting here and have it be all over the place and and then by I like to me implying like y'all need to get your stuff together and focus on some of these people that you've been disrespecting for 10 years, you know? Wow. So, so it, I'm interested to see how it goes. It is kind of weird that they didn't pull her off, but I also think that there's some PR to pulling her off the ballot then that, or, or yeah. maybe a precedent Might that it sets. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So who knows? Um, I wanted to flag something that, and Adam, you usually know a little bit more about this kind of stuff than I do, so I'm wondering if you're savvy to any of this, but there's this uh, the David Bowie release coming out. It's to celebrate the uh, 50th anniversary of Zig, uh, Rise and Fall of Ziggy Stardust and mm-hmm. the Spiders, um, and it part of it is something that I've never heard of again, so like you... 
you get a picture disc, which I've got picture discs. They're cool. Like, you know, they're fun. I hate playing them because I'm afraid they're going to screw up the picture. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. But then the second thing you get is a half speed mastered LP of the album. And what it says oh, is when it's when it's half speed recorded or half speed mastered, it takes twice as long for it to be etched and therefore creates a fuller, more accurate sound. Now, when I hear this, I start thinking of 4K TVs where I'm like, are we really going here? Is this going to be the thing now where it's like half speed is the new thing? The half speed master. Because mastered. now, yeah, like now we're... Um, you know, like vinyl is such a thing again. And every couple of years, just like TVs and video game consoles and whatever it is, like we need to be like, a, oh, what's the what's the thing where I can say I have the better right. version of it? What's the thing that I, what's the improvement that's actually like getting, <clears throat> I mean, getting me to rebuy this? So have you ever heard of this before? Yes. Yes, I have. Okay. Um, I personally haven't had like an A and B experience where I could listen to like, Okay, ready? Here is the regular Speedmaster, and here's the half Speedmaster. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't quite know what to think about it. It doesn't. It's not necessarily a new technology. Um, right. It's just kind of in in a world that seems to be becoming more and more like oversaturated. Um, it seems to be a selling point kind of thing where it's like, well, you like you could buy their pressing, but we have the half speed master, which is going to have a higher fidelity. And so I, I personally don't know if there is a serious noticeable difference. Um, it kind of makes sense, but like if, if it's etched at however many RPMs, is it really going to sound better being etched at a slower speed Mm -hmm. um i mean it's no there is somewhat of a noticeable difference between like listening to a 33 rpm versus a 45 rpm sure oh of course yeah so if it's something like that where it's that level of you know if you've got a halfway decent like my setup is still like entry level Mm -hmm. so but i can definitely hear the difference i mean 45s just sound better they're just less convenient because you have to get up and turn the record over every two or three songs instead of every six or seven songs so um it's it's interesting to me especially as someone who has you know uh, studied and taken college courses on acoustics and things like that. It, it's, it's really interesting and intriguing to me as far as the technology goes, but I can't say that I would necessarily pay significantly more for a half speed master. You know, yeah. I might pay a little bit more, but you know, if it's, if it's 18 or $20 for the regular pressing and like $40 for the half speed master, I'm not going to care about the half speed. Yeah, I'm just looking. I'm wondering if if we start seeing it as a trend, like if 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 some of these start to bubble up and they do well, because the people who are going to buy this are the people who already own the original pressings or or have owned it before, Probably. and they're looking for they're looking for a way to mm-hmm. gin up some interest in celebration of it, and it's cool. Like I'm I'm never opposed to coming up with a a better, newer. Yeah, thing. totally. It's just like, is it? Is it shtick? Is it a sales pitch? Or is it actually providing some kind of value to the situation? Yeah. So, so I, I haven't knows? heard it personally, whether or not it, it makes a huge difference, but it, it's interesting. Yeah. We'll see. Um, and then the last thing is that, you know, 30, almost 30 years later, we just randomly got a Pink Floyd yeah. <laughs> song, kind of. It's very strange. Obviously, with everything going on in the Ukraine, things are all over the place, and right. everybody has their own reactions to things. And um, it's it's you know had a ripple effect across every industry and and every group. Um, yeah. And so what happened here is so crazy. And and you know, needless to say, like 
no no Roger Waters in this. Like, he's, of course not. No, he's yeah. <laughs> that guy is just uh, if you like. They I don't know if you it's if, just <laughs> yeah. I don't, well, and I don't know if you guys are Pink Floyd fans or not. Like, oh yes, I, I like them a lot. Right. Um, I'm not the diehard, but I, it, you know, big fan for sure. Yeah, that's right. Um, with it. And I'm able to separate. Uh, I'm at a point where I can separate his stuff from the music. It's never really tainted it for right. me. Um, I'm having that a little bit with Eric Clapton right now, where I'm like, "This dude needs to shut up, or you're really gonna, <laughs> you're, you're really gonna ruin some Derek of the Dominoes jams." Yeah, um, that's happened for but, me. Um, yeah, but uh, so. He had this Ukrainian sing- singer um, who posted a clip on on Instagram, um, and he was performing a U- Ukrainian protest song um, wow. on Instagram. And so uh, David Gilmore and Nick Mason, so two out of three of the current living Pink Floyd members, um, reached out and said, hey, can we take your vocal from this? Um, from an Instagram video wow. and and uh, soundtrack it to a new song. And so like David and Nick wrote a song and used his vocals over it. And it sounds like Pink Floyd. It actually sounds yeah. pretty great. It's pretty yeah. cool. It's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, it's really cool. And it's for a, good, a cool cause and it makes a really great message. Um, and, you know, I felt this way about Rage Against the Machine when we were going through all this crazy stuff the past few years where I'm like, guys, where are you? Like, where where are you right now right. when when tribalism is ruling and everything feels like it's on fire and then <laughs> we need you right now <laughs> and you can't get it right. together because you're not getting enough of a paycheck how, how is that rage uh, against yeah, the machine what are you doing like what's happening here and so like now you see the precipice of potential world war again mm-hmm. and you get pink floyd back here like we go. that makes sense you know like that's this is what should be happening right yeah. now. Like, great. This is, this is like, it did when I saw it, it hit the weight. It, it sounds messed up, but like the weight of what this means me- felt that much more. Yes. Like I do have anxiety about what's going on and yeah, it for hurts sure. me thinking about what's going on in Ukraine. And then when we get Pink terrible. Floyd has to do something about it, I'm like, guys, this is, Bad. bad yeah like, right. was, you, you woke up the you guys got giant. Pink Floyd, yeah <laughs> you guys got pink floyd back like this is really a problem you woke up godzilla like what yeah yeah for what real did you yeah. do yeah yeah um all right we got a few uh a few milestones here to, to hit yeah right? birthday i'm i'm personally just i'm big on birthdays i love yeah selling celebrating people's birthdays loved ones particularly but just honoring people on their birthday um, so Always fun. we've got some, uh, we got some good ones this weekend. So May 6th, 1945, Bob Seeger, um, well-known singer songwriter has sold more than a hundred million albums worldwide. That's, I think he's better than Bruce Springsteen. I know I like that's, I, I prefer Seeger over Springsteen, but that's a me thing. It's, I mean, th- the pedigree is hard to deny. It's, yeah. it's, uh, you know. He feels like the real deal. All of his music has always felt like the real deal. Where I'm yeah, like, yeah, for sure, yeah. for sure. Sorry, Bruce. And then, uh, <laughs> we all know your feelings about Bruce Springsteen, Liam. It's okay. It's yeah, okay. You don't have right. to love yeah. everybody. It's all good. Yeah. <laughs> Bruce is listening to this episode. Of course so he is. Right <laughs> <laughs> I just lost. We just lost a listener. Oh man. <laughs> man. <laughs> so sorry, Bruce. Um, so May 6th, 1971, American guitarist, Chris Shiflett, um, of the Foo Fighters most notably, but, um, he joined Foo Fighters in 1999, uh, but was also a member of No Use for a Name and Me First and the Gimme Gimmies. So, uh, well-known, you know, another strong argument for the Foo Fighters actually being a super group, right? Yeah. We talk about that pretty frequently. (laughs) Yeah. And also a uh, fellow podcaster too. He's, yeah, he's got a he's, podcast, right? For a long time, like he. Oh, I he was like an early adopter. Hun- yeah, I think he's been doing it for like he's got hundreds of episodes. I'm pretty sure, and wow. it's like interviews with some incredible, um, some. Cra- it's called Walking the Floor. He does a bunch of interviews. It's really great. Um, yeah, it's Shiflet's weird because I feel like everybody had this 
I don't know. I feel like the Foo Fighters for many people got set in stone at the trio when Shiflet's really been there. Like that's 99 is four years, five years into the band's Mm -hmm. life. He's been in the band for multiple decades now, 20 20 something years. (laughs) Uh Like he's, he's a member. He's not just like a guy who plays, he's full on, you Mm -hmm, know, mm -hmm. but I feel like a lot of people still think of the Foo Fighters sometimes as that core trio. And then sometimes Pat Smear plays with them. Right. Or sometimes Rami Jaffe or whatever. Um, but no, I, he's. They keep I, growing. It's <laughs> yeah, but it's it's Shiflet is the real deal, man. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, and then May seventh, nineteen sixty nine. Uh, we were talking about this a little bit before we started, but Eagle Eye oh, yeah. Cherry, happy birthday to him, Swedish musician. Yeah. Didn't yeah. know that. Uh, his is a Swede, and um. Also, interesting fact that Eagle Eye Cherry is not a stage name. That is his legal birth name. So crazy. <laughs> blew, so crazy. Blew my mind. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so crazy. I, I feel like I knew he had some sort of reputable parent or something like that from pop up video. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. And. <laughs> Like I feel like pop up video informed a lot of my musical knowledge from the late nineties oh, because definitely. I remember there was that Tal Bachman "She's So High" song that came oh, out like course. right yeah. around the same time as this, and I remember pop up video being like Randy Bachman is Tal Bachman's dad, and I was like, oh okay, I guess that makes sense. Last name, yeah, it's pretty, it's, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I remember there being some kind of pop up where it was like. And his dad's a jazz musician, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. Um, yeah, where is Eli Cherry? It's, there's so many one-hit wonders from mm, that era, man. Let's see. It's so weird. What yeah. does Wikipedia have to say? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm sure he's still out there doing it, but. Yeah, I don't know. He's so, done some film work. Yeah. Um, yeah, not not much, really. Yeah. I feel like there's so many of His those fifth, artists. He, so he put out a fifth album in 2018, but not really much okay. info after that. All right. So he's probably still doing stuff. Yeah. Well, happy birthday. Good for him. Happy birthday. Yeah. Um, and then here's an interesting one. May 8th, 1911. American blues artist Robert Johnson. Uh, landmark recordings, 1936 and 1937, influenced later generations of blues and rock, including Muddy Waters, Eric Clapton, Rolling Stones. And uh, he actually died in 1938 at the age of 27. So he is oh, the, the originator. Like, inaugural member yeah. of the 27 Club, which is kind of... It's kind of a little bit Twilight Zone, a little kind of yeah. interesting, because that, there's that whole, like mythos behind him like did he go to the crossroads and sell his soul to the devil was that just a song you know so what's happening there did all these other you know 27 club members sell their soul who knows so interesting stuff Uh, you know i'm a little bit of a you know mythology geek so or modern mythology whatever you want to call it so Mm -hmm. that stuff is always like do 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 yeah (laughs) um and then May 8th, 1943, Tony Tennille of the husband and wife duo, Captain and Tennille, best known for their singles, uh, Do That To Me One More Time and Love Will Keep Us Together. Uh, I have a Captain and Tennille record around here somewhere. You should. Um, yeah. One of my, I always think of, because this just speaks to my age. So I have this really strange memory of um, seeing an episode of, this is going to date me so hard, but the Jenny McCarthy show on oh MTV. Do y'all remember that? So, yeah. and she had musical guests, right? And one of the musical guests was presidents of the United States of America. Boom. And, um, they played volcano. It was in, in support of two, their second album. And like, one of my absolute favorite songs of theirs to the point that it's literally one of like our bedtime, our bedtime song songs with my, with my daughters. Um, they know mm. all the lyrics to volcano and oh my God. on the Jenny McCarthy show, they played volcano. Uh, Chris Ballou was in like some kind of 
animal suit costume with like a red flying V guitar and playing along with them was captain from captain and Tennille. <laughs> he on the piano. So weird. <laughs> I love that on the Jenny McCarthy, on the Jenny show. McCarthy show. So I'm sure it's on YouTube probably. So there's I'll, gotta I'll be to a find great it. story behind why that happened too. Like how did that, how and he's, that all he's there with together. the captain's hat and the whole, it's some, it was amazing. I'm going to get to the bottom of this. I, I, I transparently, I did something with Chris Berlou not too long ago and there's a chance I'm reconnecting with him and I'm going to ask him this now. How so it was we got the Jenny captain. McCarthy show. How did how did Captain get on the Jenny McCarthy I'll have to show find the you? YouTube clip because I gotta ask him about it. Unless I, it was some fever dream that I had, but I have a very vivid memory of this being a thing. So we'll have to look it now, up. Now, did did he was he wear do you remember him in your fever dream wearing sunglasses? I, I don't he think almost, he had sunglasses, which is That's weird. Yeah, so but he did have the captain's hat. Because he has ginormous, or he had he recently passed. That was passed, his signature look. Ginormous yeah. eyeballs. He had huge eyeballs. Like he had a condition really? called something. Yeah. If you find a picture of the captain without sunglasses on, his eyes just look like his pupils and whatever just look ginormous. Oh, yeah, it's crazy. He's got. He had a condition that I don't. Who knows what? It's, it's giant eyeball condition. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so he always had sunglasses on because it was like, so it wasn't a crazy, just a distracting thing. thing. No, it wasn't just a vibe. It was like he, I feel like he was like embarrassed by it or something. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's there. It's, it's, uh, it's on YouTube. Okay. I'm looking at it now. Yeah. So Chris out. is in like some kind of, yeah. And captain's there. He, he's got the captain's hat, but he does not have sunglasses. Not have sunglasses. Okay. And, and Chris blue is in some, I was right about the red flying V and he's in some kind of like bear costume. Chris Blue is, of course. Amazing. And yep, there it is. I'm gonna report back. <laughs> All right. Oops, I played it by accident. Don't <laughs> don't take us down. Um, <laughs> I don't know. No one's listening. No, that's good. Just Bruce Springsteen. Just well, Bruce, Bruce Springsteen. Springsteen no, he's, oh, yeah, yeah, he's, he's yeah, out. He's bounce. out. Yeah, he we lost our tub. we lost our yeah. big listener. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's get through this if we can. May 8th, 1953, happy birthday to Alex Van Halen, best known as the drummer and co-founder of Van Halen. Alex um, went on to become an ordained minister and presided over the wedding of his brother, Eddie Van Halen, in 20, 2009. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. I love the weird little facts like that. It's my favorite part of doing these birthdays. Um, a couple more, uh, May 8th, 1975, happy birthday to the King of Latin pop Enrique Iglesias, um, has sold an estimated 70 million records worldwide. So oh, happy birth. Yeah. Man. So many records. So that mole though. Happy- <laughs> I don't, I can't. <laughs> it's not for you. That- <laughs> it's for the ladies. There's- that's true. There's that Austin Powers moment. I was with, just going to say that. Oh, my yes. God. Yes. There's, and every time I remember seeing that, and I was just like, that's what I feel with Enrique Iglesias. I just like, can't get past <laughs> moly, the moly, 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 moly. <laughs> oh, my God. Good uh, on and then last but not least, um, we have on May 9th, um, happy birth, uh, 1949, happy birthday to Billy Joel. Um, quintessential American singer songwriter. Icon. Yeah. Um, Long Island's very own train wreck. It's Long fantastic. Island. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but dude, like, good on that guy. I, I may have said it on here before, but good on that guy for just tapping and figuring. Like, he was like, I wrote my body of work. That's it. You know, like he wrote his eight albums or 10 albums or whatever it is. And he wrote some of the most iconic pop rock songs of that era. And he's like not trying to do anything. He just goes out and plays now. He's like, hey, you want to hear my songs that I wrote like 20 years ago? Yeah, he's just happy come. to do and that. And then like, mm-hmm. come next month, I'll play some other songs. And like, we can just all hang out and I'll yeah. play my songs. <laughs> like, I kind of love that. Yeah, he's, he's all over the place. But yeah. There it is. And uh, so since we have a guest on today, we are going to forego our normal game. We'll come back. Yeah, we got uh, stuff to talk about. Yeah, we got, we, got, we got some business to take care of. So um, we're going to flip it over 
and uh, I'm happy to just let Seth loose. I'm happy to just be along for the ride. And uh, yeah, we are going to have our minds expanded on the topic of Porter Robinson. And I couldn't be more excited about it. Y'all ready? Yeah, I got questions. I'm I got questions. Born ready. <laughs> I was born ready. <laughs> Let's do it. Welcome back to side B of our 23rd episode of Retro Groove. Um, and as we mentioned on side A, with us today is dear, dear friend of the podcast, Seth Sturgill of the All In podcast. Recently, uh, very, very happy for him uh, announcing going full time content creation. So cool. Um, couldn't be happening yeah. to a nicer dude and a more worthy creator. So congratulations on that. Um, Before we do the deep dive into Porter, um, do you want to just plug anything that you're um, excited about coming up that you're doing or that you're currently um, in the, in the middle of or anything like that? Definitely. Yeah. I mean, so I don't know um, when this episode's going live, but um, this coming Friday. So the sixth. Okay. Okay, so so tomorrow then, at the time this episode goes live, on the 7th, we're launching um, All In Episode 100, Ooh. which is um, the you know, 100th episode of, of my, my main podcast. Wow. So that's, awesome. that's huge. Yeah. Yeah, we, we've got a, a lot of stuff in that. the works for that. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, we've been working really hard on that. It's, it's going to be big. Um, we're really excited about that. And then, yeah, like I, I stream on... Um, so, so really, going full time, I, I just sort of like have the opportunity now to um to to go all in <laughs> frankly yes. on it and um you know and and to uh really make this thing as big as possible so i'm streaming like six nights a week you know Perfect. i'm working on video essays last time i was here we talked about my um jet set radio video essay so that was awesome. there's going to be much more of uh, of that great um i'm like currently working on three right now um Whoa. And, um, so, so there's, there's a lot of, lot of exciting stuff in the works for sure. Can't wait. Yeah. It's, it's been awesome. I've been doing that for full time now for, for about a week. And it's, I was telling you guys, I was like, I just wish I didn't have to sleep. Like, I I wish I could just (laughs) do it nonstop. If it wasn't for that pesky, you know, human need to like eat and sleep, I'd be good. Yeah. (laughs) I've I've done as many hacks as I can to try to squeeze as much, uh, out of my nights as possible without being an absolute zombie the next day. And, you know. It's very possibly taking gears off my life, so it might. <laughs> I might be making up time now only to pay for it later, but you know, they'll come up with some kind of technology. But for the now, t- we. <laughs> but for now, we. <laughs> Absolutely. So we um, we have a concept on the show called Expand My Mind, and it comes from the idea that you know, in order to be a well-rounded music fan. Um, we need to be, uh, on the open-minded side of side of things and be willing to, um, admit that we're wrong sometimes, or just simply allow ourselves to be schooled on something new, um, Mm -hmm. that we, you know, we don't always have to be right all the time and we don't always have to know everything all the time. And that's just kind of a philosophy that I live my life by. Um, but it translates so wonderfully into the music world because there's just so much amazing um, art being made out there in, in every medium. But, you know, with music, um, it's such an emotional and such a personal art form um, that if if I don't want to miss out on anything. So, um, you know, Seth has been so vocal about his uh 
love and appreciation for Porter Robinson for so long that I'm like, I need to. (laughs) (laughs) I was putting it in a nice way, but but, um, it's just true. It's just an artist that I don't really have any experience with at all. So what better way to learn about an artist than, you know, have, have you come on Seth and just, you know, talk about it for as long as you want to like you, <laughs> you've basically yeah, got man. the floor as far as I'm concerned. Um, so kind of typically the way that we start these is, um, by beginning with the question and then letting it lead on from there, you know, when was it and how was it that you came to discover Porter Robinson and what were your like early experiences? Okay. So the way I discovered Porter was actually through Porter's brother, Nick Robinson, um, who is a pretty prolific YouTuber. At the time, I was a fan of Nick's. Um, He was much, much smaller. He was working for, I don't know if you guys, um, this was probably 10-ish years ago. There was a kind of smaller spinoff of the, like, Discovery Channel was getting into games media coverage. And Mm. they had this this games media site called Rev3 Games. Um, And it was was kind of short-lived. It was only around for a few years. And anyway, Nick was one of the kind of, like, on-camera personalities Mm -hmm. of Rev3 Games. Um, and through him is, is where I discovered, uh, Porter. Um, and it was right around the time worlds was coming out and, uh, which is Porter's debut studio album. Mm -hmm. And, um, he was kind of releasing like some singles and, um, and the first Porter song I'd ever heard is, um, the sing, probably the biggest single from worlds, which is called sad machine. And, um, I just, that, that track just like totally blew me away. And it's not even my favorite track on the record now, but like that was my first kind of introduction to him. And I, and from there, I just kind of like, I I went down the rabbit hole with him. I just, I had to know everything. I had to listen to where he came from. I had to listen to like the origins and stuff. Mm Cause that, that may have been his debut. Um, Worlds may have been his debut album, but like he had done many, many more things before then. Um, yeah, there's and, always and the deeper cuts. That DJ. Yeah. Totally. He was in that kind of like DJ world for a while. He had released an EP, um, called Spitfire, um, that, that we can get into. I, cause I just, you know, I just went through his whole, you know, and I've followed him ever since, like very, awesome. very closely. I've just been a huge fan. Were you an EDM fan prior to all that? Like you said, you got in because his brother was a YouTuber, but were you yeah. already familiar with that and like into that kind of I don't even want to call it a genre because it's really expansive, but like, were you into that kind of music? Totally. I, yeah, I definitely had my moments. It's really funny because the, um, the, the start of kind of like Porter's journey is through DDR and DDR was also kind of when I dance dance revolution, the game was kind of when I, um, when I also was introduced to that kind of music, the, the sort of like, you know, the, the hands up, you know, kind of trance, you know, um, Euro dance music, you know, I talked about bass hunter earlier, like stuff like that. I w I've always been really into, um, they, they sort of tap into that. There's another, um, you know, cause we, we obviously talk about video game music when we're together all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also the sort of like, um, Tetsuya Mizuguchi, which is like one of my favorite game directors, a lot of his games. So he's responsible for games like Res and, um, Child of Eden and, you know, um, Tetris effect connected. Oh man. Um, like, like that's all very like just emotionally charged, deep like edm and, and that stuff that i've always been like very mm-hmm. connected to and, and porter totally taps into that but do you, so you because you had said that you had been kind of soundtracking video games for yourself mm-hmm. ages before so you were listening we're talking like teenage years you were oh yeah li- you were into it how did you because i've Again, I've I said I've dipped my toe in at moments, but I've never been swept away by the current. I guess. Um, sure. Ha- what was it like? Can you kind of explain what it is about, just in broader strokes, like what EDM kind of has meant to you, or what that electro side of things is? Is it is it the the lack of it being about a singer, like about a front person, and it's more an orchestrator, a producer, like what? It, what do you feel like it is that makes it connect for you? 
there's something primal about it. Like there's okay. something very sort of like, especially when you're seeing this kind of music live, which, um, which I've had the opportunity to now, um, a few times, like going and, and like experiencing, it's like you're being hit with just like a tidal wave of sound and energy. And like, wow. there, there's a real emotional reaction that I have to it just from mm-hmm. like, not, not only just like the, the sort of like driving beats and stuff, you know, I, I think before I would have said that it's not necessarily a focus on lyrics or whatever, but actually, um, Porter's music is very, very yeah. lyrical. Um, and, and I connect deeply to, to a lot of his lyrics and stuff, but, um, it's just, I don't know. There, there's some sort of, there, there's something a little bit deeper to EDM. There's something that I can't quite quantify hmm. about it. It's like a visceral, primal really is the best word i have for it it's like an it uncontrollable resonates. yeah resonant kind of thing so <laughs> this is w- when res came out they released this little like accessory for the ps2 where it would just like pulse like it would just pulse the dual shock to mm-hmm. the beat of the music and you know and now that like tetris effect connected is out it makes you know use of the hd rumble on switch there's something about that kind of like feeling just like just just it, it just all of the senses are just overloaded by emotion and feeling like Tetris effect connected. I always say is like, like that's the Tetris game that'll make you cry at the end. Like if you just let yourself get like swept up in it. Yeah. Um, And there's just something to that. Like, like EDM, like good EDM, you know, there, there's some kind of more commercial EDM that, that I don't really get into, but, but when EDM allows itself to, to have that other layer to it, I just get totally, and I'm a very like emotional person anyway. Sure. Um, and, and so like I get swept up in a lot of things. I'm a total crier at movies and video games and stuff. And, you know, I, I totally get swept up in this stuff anyway. So maybe I'm just sort of a little more, I guess, attuned to that. But, mm-hmm. um, but mm-hmm. yeah, EDM just totally taps into that vibe for me. Well, it's interesting because, th- and in listening to some of Porter's music in kind of sort of in preparation for this. Um, so e- EDM almost by design pushes up against a, a, a side and you talked about live music which is something I mm-hmm. really want to talk about a little bit but um, the sense of of live music as we're usually talking about with other genres is a space of um, improvisation error so like like f- faults and then the fixes and th- like that is not by nature most EDM in a live setting right like it is it is orchestrated when i've seen live DJs it is like down to the millisecond produced for you to have a certain experience. Um, And I think that if it's done in a certain way, you don't need that side of the, the improvisation, or you don't necessarily need to tap into something where you're like, what's going to happen next? I don't know. What are they going to do? And instead you're allowing uh, a message or allowing an emotion to be conveyed mm-hmm. you're kind of like signing up it feels almost communal in a in a certain way totally. which I, again like i've gone to a bunch of fish shows and i've tried to patch into whatever is going on around me and it never happens it's just <laughs> i can't do it i it's, maybe it's the lack of drugs yeah you don't have, have the no right drugs it's, it's <laughs> i don't know what it is but like i can stand there and i could appreciate the fact that like they're figuring it out on the stage and it's always going to be different and that is really cool but it just never clicks with me and i've had the same thing at and again like granted most of my live edm experiences are at festivals although i think that that's most like that's a lot of edm right it's like totally if you're going to go yeah. see stuff you're at a festival where you're bouncing around and you're seeing stuff and mm-hmm. um and and like I can feel the energy around me. I can feel everybody plugged in. Mm-hmm. And I've never like found the adapter. Like I've never found the jack to right. be like this is <laughs> this is me getting into it. Sure. Um. But yeah, I I wonder if it's it, it, like for Porter specifically. As I was listening to it, he seems to kind of um make up for again that lack of of improvisation or the exp- 
the expression doesn't come from playing a, a guitar solo in a certain inflection or whatever. It's the detail and the intricacy uh, of what he's kind of sculpted for you, both lyrically and also sonically, that makes it, it still feels raw, even though it's like produced pop music, right? Like there is a rawness right. within this kind of slickly produced song. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's accurate. And and I mean the um especially Porter's latest album Nurture is an incredibly raw, like vulnerable, um lyrically vulnerable album. And I mean there are um th- there are tracks on there where it's just like him and a piano, mm-hmm. you know. Um and then w- which obviously when you're when you're seeing that live that kind of has that more traditional. I saw Porter live late last year um in Austin and um on on the Nurture tour and one another thing that Porter is really good about to sort of bridge that gap that you're talking about because I think if if he were here right now I think you would agree and 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 I for him he approaches his live set as when you come to my show the songs will be played differently the compositions oh. are all different um so you actually come in and you don't know when the songs are going to be slotted in or how they're going to be performed. They're completely okay. different compositions, wow. Cool. Um, which is, which is interesting. So for work. example, it is, it's a ton of work and, and that's, I mean, Porter's a, a workhorse, which is another thing that I, that I really relate to with him. He's, he's like just one of the hardest working musicians you'd ever, you'd ever care to learn about. Mm. And um, he, so going to see him live it was a total like I, I'm at this point intimately familiar with the album and, you know, it's the whole experience, you know, and again, like I said, the primal getting hit by the sound and stuff and, and being in that crowd energy is all great. But at the same time, I don't know what's going to happen next. I, cause, you know, he doesn't just roll through the album like he he plays the songs in different moments. His kind of like encore song is not the song that I thought it was going to be whatsoever. <laughs> OK. And. And then like Love it made that. total sense when he did it. You know what I mean? Like it just, he, he found this way to kind of like keep you guessing even as a super fan, mm-hmm. you know, and he even like, isn't afraid to tap into some of his earlier stuff too, because he knows that, um, he has fans in the crowd that want to hear stuff from, you know, the spitfire days, you know, so he's not afraid to whip that out either. So he's, it's a really great experience. It's one of the best shows I've ever been to. Wow. So, so would you, when I'm listening to his music, um, I get a feeling like I get with a handful of people in hip hop right now as well, where there is emo, alt, whatever, however you want to qualify it. Um, but there's something very different from a lot of the other EDM artists or the way that they're approaching things. Um, this isn't Diplo. This isn't Tiesto. This is, this is, is there a term for it? Is is are there other artists like him? Is there somebody else who's making emo EDM or sure, whatever yeah. we call it? Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, so uh, Porter Porter's sort of like music rival person that influenced they, they influenced each other. They came up in the same kind of time. They met online on like an EDM music production forum when like Porter was fourteen and he was twelve, and that's an artist called Maddion. Oh, okay, um, yeah. Yeah, and um, so so Maddion and and Porter are very much kind of like in that same oh. vibe, and they actually wound up producing um, a song together called uh, called Shelter, and it's probably the biggest song either one of them have produced. You know, okay. Um, so I would say that Maddion's kind of in that same vibe, and then Porter also has a really good when when he puts his tours together, he's really good about working with artists that are while they aren't necessarily occupying the same space, they they have the same vibe. So um, on the Nurture tour, he was touring with um, this this guy named Jai Wolf. And, um, he, he was like totally, again, not that style of music, but right. very much carried that vibe, you know? And I, I really liked that a like lot. A sincerity. Um, uh, mm-hmm. interesting. Uh, but he still plays the big ultra Daisy zoo, like all, he plays all of those things as well. He exists in that space with the, yes. the Zeds and, and, and whatnot. Um, but then has his own lane too. That's really cool totally totally um, porter uh, porter specifically um you know go, going through his history like he 
it was very, very important to him that he kind of created his own sound and his own kind of lane to operate in outside of the traditional EDM style. Okay. Um, so I saw the, there was worlds back in 2014, 14. Like yeah. yeah. And then nurture was last year. So mm-hmm. was it a seven year gap? Was there other stuff in between there that I didn't see? I mean, I know so, that I saw he was, he does a lot of different things. I saw he does like a music festival and some other stuff, but there's a lot on here. It's so funny. Yeah, so it's it's so funny that you say that because that's kind of the whole narrative around Nurture is like, oh, like there's a big seven-year gap between albums and stuff. But really, um, putting yourself in Porter's headspace there, and, and he did like so much. Like in a period that Porter would call a creative drought, the guy not only produced multiple you know, festivals mm-hmm. like indie EDM festivals, Secret Sky and Second Sky. Okay. Um, he also, you know, d- that was during the time that he produced Shelter with Matty on, right? Um, which, like I said, it was a mega hit. And, you know, they they did like a, there was like an animated music video for that, that, uh, that they produced with Crunchyroll, which was like amazing. Nice. So he was very involved with that. Mm-hmm. Um, but but really, um, there's another huge project that Porter did that he didn't even attach his name to called Virtual Self. Um, okay. Virtual Self was basically this like five track EP um, that was kind of wrapped around this ARG, this this sort of like love letter to the days of the, you know, the online Internet forums and creating your own kind of virtual identity online. It's got that kind of like that very maximalist, edgy, late 90s, early 2000s, that kind of like that Matrix, Final Mm -hmm. Fantasy, Spirits Within, Y2K vibe. You know what I mean? Um it's like it's like the the soundtrack to like the um you know the the best like 2002 RPG that you never played nice. you know what I mean <laughs> um and and so like the virtual self though was such a like unique and intense experience like when the promotion for virtual self was ramping up um Porter created basically these two like fake characters for okay. the for the promo mm-hmm. um there, there was um, a character called Path Selector and then Technic Angel. And the idea was that these were the two artists behind Virtual Self. And they had their own Twitter accounts, their own YouTube, Instagram, and all of this. Oh, wow. And then it goes even deeper than that. There was an entire online forum created, like in the old style of online forums. Nice. Mm-hmm. Created for Virtual Self. And if you had the patience to dig through like the cryptic posting and stuff on there, you would maybe find these scattered dates and coordinates. And those were the dates and places for the virtual self tour. Oh, my wow. God. So it was stuff like that. And this is and by the way, there's a track on virtual self called Ghost Voices, which was nominated for a Grammy that year. Oh, really? Oh my God. So. This is just the stuff that he's doing, like, on the side that he doesn't even attach his name to. <laughs> well, yeah. and even, know. like, looking at the the history here, his debut album hit number one on the Billboard Dance Electronic chart. Like, mm-hmm. yep. his debut album. Like, that's yeah. that's crazy. Yeah. I, I, I wonder, so d- did you follow him through all of that, like you were hip to him. And so you followed all of that was going on. Um, and did you ever feel like it was some sort of a departure or did you feel like this guy, you were just along for the ride and he was curating this experience and you're just kind of absorbing and trusting what he's kind of sculpting for you. I mean, it's a, a lot of unique stuff um, that I feel like you need to just say, yeah, I I believe in you and your creativity and it speaks to me. And so I'm going to tell me what's next. Show me what's next. I want to know what happens. I I think so. I I think it's also like the way that Porter kind of, you know, approaches his own art is really interesting because for, for him, it really is just about the experience and like the, the love of it. And he doesn't feel the need to attach 
his name to something um, unless it fits like his own idea of his sound and the evolution and maturation of that sound. So Mm -hmm. when he comes up with something like virtual self, he's like, okay, this can be its own thing. A lot of people don't know. This is a really good example of this. A lot of people don't know that uh, Porter co-wrote Clarity, the the Zed mega hit Clarity. Oh, wow. Okay. Like Porter co-wrote that and he he was saying he's like guys like, i could live off of clarity royalties if i wanted, if you wanted to. to like right, it's not right, right 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 you know like that was such a massive hit and, <laughs> and you know he he took his name off of that because he was getting ready he was ramping up into full production on worlds and he was like you know i i don't want people to know me as the clarity guy as i'm uh-huh. producing this as i'm producing this kind of more emotional you know, kind of vibe with worlds. So, I wow. mean, he's very much, it's, a, it's about the art for him. You know, he yeah. doesn't need the, the name recognition or anything like that. But you know? to have that vision is pretty great. You know, like it seems like he's somebody who has that. And also just as an aside, he uses his, that's his real name, right? We play the yeah. name game here. I mean, yep. Adam, we could just spend months doing EDM names oh, yeah, that of course. none of us oh, would yeah, ever yeah. know. <laughs> Who is Cashmere Cat? I have no idea, you know? like, um, But I, I can't, I'm trying to think of other artists that actually use their name. I mean, I think Tiesto is Tiesto, yeah. Um, Espe- but- yeah, especially in the EDM space. Yeah, so you've got like your David Guetta's and Guetta stuff. Guetta's, but, yeah, but, right, yeah, right, 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 right. That's that's about it Paul, though. Paul There's Oak not and much. Fold, like those earlier guys, yeah. like Paul Oak and Fold. Um, but it does say something to be like, uh, "This is me, and I'm putting my name on it, and I'm I, this isn't a project, so to speak." Like Virtual Self, maybe is a project, but then there's right. the, there's Porter. I remember. Um, getting into bright eyes and loving bright eyes. And then when there wasn't bright eyes and there was Connor Oberst records, I'm like, well, what does this mean? Yeah. <laughs> and now I can kind of know like, Oh, Connor does this stuff as himself. And this bright eyes is a, is a band or a collective totally. or a different vibe or whatever. Um, so I could, it, it's, it's cool for, for somebody to have that vision to say like, this is what this is. This is what that is. And the next time I'm going to do, this and just come with me and trust me yeah um so you seen him live you said yeah i saw him live uh late last year for the for the nurture tour in austin um i he he did kind of a stop kind of adjacent to like acl it was in early november okay and um that that was an amazing show i it, it was one of those things where i was like look this is one of my favorite albums just ever i you know austin's not that far like I, I gotta go. You know yeah. what I mean. So, and was that the first time you'd seen him? Mm-hmm. That was the oh, first wow. time I'd seen him live. Okay. Yeah. Um, and you'd seen other live EDM before that. Yes. And measured yeah. up. How was it similar? Was it different? Like, so what was the experience? It's really like? interesting. Like, like I've seen Maddie on live, mm-hmm. and Maddie on, and and a lot of EDM musicians, a lot of them don't really it's more about the music than the person, you know, mm-hmm. like it's more, um, it, it's a lot of them are just kind of like standing behind the kit, you know, and, and sometimes even like literally not even with the spotlight on them. A lot of times they're just there and it's all about the visuals screens. behind them. The, yeah. Yeah. The screens, the pyros, the lights and stuff like that. And, um, but, but Porter has a real like stage presence that I think is unique. Mm-hmm. And he, he really does kind of, if you watch him live, he kind of works the stage like a rock musician, you know, That's and cool. that was actually, that was something that, um, he, he had to learn. Like he, um, he actually worked with a coach, a stage presence coach, to wow. break into that he he was talking i saw an interview with him one time where he was like look like i'm used to being the dj i'm not used to being the guy but i right. want to be the more you know th- this music is me and i want to be able to be you know reflecting on it um and expressing myself physically on the stage as i'm performing it mm-hmm. you know and he does a really good job too of like doing audience interaction and stuff and um what there's a really famous thing that porter does where um sad machine has a really iconic kind of hook to it um and he he'll he'll bring out his launch pad and just have like somebody and he'll pick somebody in the crowd and like show them how to do it. You know, it's just dun, 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 you know, and, That's um, awesome. and then that launches into the full song. He does that every show, you know, it's just fun stuff like that. He really kind of That's involves cool. himself in the performance. Yeah. Now the, it's still, so I remember back to seeing Zed, 
Um, I think it was like a Lollapalooza years ago. And I just remember being floored by the amount of visuals and, and, and pageantry in the best possible way of just yes. like, it's a spectacle. It is, it is an immersive experience that you're being exposed to and tapping into. Um, but I would assume contrary to like uh, a marshmallow or like chain smokers or dead mouse or any of these other artists where it it's predominantly like they're coming there, they're playing their hits, they're presenting this thing to you. It feels more immersive than like, did you get that from the Porter show? Um, yeah. As opposed yeah, to Porter, others, maybe. So it's really interesting too. another thing. And this is just another part of, of Porter as an artist is he really does approach like he he approaches the live performance the tour side of it as its own it's almost like it's its own completely separate thing yes he's playing the music but he's playing it differently mm -hmm. and it also needs to be um evocative of a singular experience so something that porter does for nurture live is he has this stage set up where he takes advantage of a projector on like the stage itself on the floor level and then makes use of the screen behind him all at the same time. Mm -hmm. So you'll be watching it and all of a sudden there's grass growing around him. And, you know, he does this really cool for one of his songs. The stage becomes a laptop, like an open laptop. Awesome. With like, so the floor is a keyboard and the, you know, and the state and the screen behind him is the, is a laptop screen and yeah. he'll connect it to a real laptop he has. And, He's like showing the webcam to the crowd and you see uh -huh. them on the screen and stuff, you know, it's stuff like that. Like he, wow. he, he really is, is innovative in the way that he even performs the stuff and visually represents the stuff live. He treats it as its own separate thing. There's, um, uh, there's a song called get your wish on, on nurture. And, um, he talks about how, and this kind of taps into something we were talking about earlier, how certain songs just make you feel a certain way mm -hmm. for Porter. He's like, when I hear this song, even when I was writing it, I imagined like fireworks over the the water at night. Like, as he grew up in North Carolina, you know, the you know beaches and stuff, and he he was talking about how he envisioned this like moment of like him and his brothers looking out to the water and at, at night and seeing the fireworks over the water, and so and one of the lyrics in "Get Your Wish" is "Tell me how it felt when you walked on water." So. Behind him, there will be fireworks, and then he's walking on water on the floor, oh, you know, as he's singing. Oh, man. It's super cool. It's just, like, this very, like, immersive experience. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Um, and not to take anything away from a great guitar player or a drummer or something like that, but in the moment to riff on a drum solo, to mm -hmm. come up with some kind of funky chord progression or whatever is one talent in and of itself. But the amount of work that goes into orchestrating, producing, building these sonic landscapes of some of these EDM performances and concerts, I mean, everything is synced up. I was talking about being at a concert not that long ago and just being reminded of how engaged the lighting director is at just a rock show, you know, like right. a, a barely like, like intricate rock show and how much is going on at that lighting board. Um, what they're doing on stage has had so much thought put into it that, like you said, he's, he's creating, like, I didn't know he made his own, uh, version for his live show that is completely mm -hmm. different from what you're hearing on Spotify or whatever. Um, but just to reemphasize the amount of work that goes into then building an entirely new album remix version. I mean, that is, that is crazy. That is a huge undertaking to say like, I care enough about my fans and my audience and what I'm trying to convey and my art that like, I'm going to give you this and then I'm going to reimagine it so that you can have your own special experience that I'm also then going to present to you. I'm presenting you one way and then I'm going to present it to you another way for this other setting. That's fantastic. It's a ton it was amazing. of work. Yeah. I can't even imagine yeah. how much work goes into that. So crazy. Um, so when I listened to Nurture, um, I mean, there's a lot of different places on that album from from where I was. It, it's holy for me. It was pretty uplifting. You know, it's like yeah, there there's some 
there's some vacillation, right? But mm-hmm. um, I feel like it felt very sincere, and it ultimately trended towards making me feel good. Um, yeah. I feel like there were a couple moments I jotted one down. There was that Dull Scythe song. Oh, sure. That was yeah. like really cool. Like I feel like that it wasn't jarring, but it was like all of a sudden I was like, wait, what is this? This is very different yeah, from some of the other that's stuff definitely that I've been listening a, to. A tonal shift, yes. Yeah. Um, I was digging it, but so what is it what is it on that album that has that spoke to you and that clicked for you when you <sighs> when it hit you? Yeah. Yeah, man. Um, there, there are so many. So that that album in general represents. So to to break down sort of his like um, his sound and, and the way he has sort of matured. Like when he when he started off, kind of again in that very you know driving beat heavy DJ EDM scene. He's a you know he's a twelve year old kid literally mm-hmm. making this stuff. It's so crazy. He, uh, wow. you, you know he he's he started off just making his own step charts on DDR and uploading what, you know, it it would, it would start off that way. He's making his own step charts. He's pulling different fills and loops and stuff like that. And then all of a sudden, before you know it, you're making your own songs, you know, he's throwing them up on a, on beat port and stuff. And, um, eventually he got noticed by this like German label. Who's like, Hey, let's fly out to these different German clubs. And, you know, you and your dad come out and play these clubs. And then he catches the eye of Skrillex, you know? Oh man, there he is. And, and and so, and so and Skrillex signed Skrillex uh, signed. He's actually Skrillex's label Ausla. Um, Porter's first EP um, was the first thing to be released under that label. Oh no way! Um, yeah, Spitfire wow. was the first thing That's to wild. be released under that label. Um, and so anyway, but but that was when like in I, I would say 2012 is kind of when Porter really defined his sound with um this this song called language mm-hmm. um and and language would go on to you know huge commercial success and stuff like that it was like the it was the main menu song on forza horizon you Uh-oh. know <laughs> um, Man. so you know and, and that's around the time he's working on clarity and stuff like that and um and and so anyway worlds though is when that that debut studio album worlds is is a total I, I think the the main word that I come back to with with Porter and now with his sound is love. Um, mm. Porter's music is always, always, always a love letter to something. Mm. Um, and Worlds is Porter's love letter to digital worlds, the 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 fantasy. It's it's his love letter to escapism in these digital worlds that we find in video games or or whatever. Um, and it's, it's this sort of love letter to, um, the time that you spend there. Like he was talking about, like, you know, he would play an MMO or something like that with the knowledge that one day this is going to go away, Mm -hmm. you know, and this won't exist anymore. And, and, you know, how valuable is my time still that I spent in this thing that is finite, you know? And so that's, that's the whole vibe (laughs) behind worlds. Um, and then what's really interesting is you go into something like virtual self, which by the way, during that period of time between 2014 and 2021, that seven year gap that everybody loves to talk about, it's like he produces a six track, like ARG EP. He produces, um, three festivals, uh, takes it on tour, produces shelter in what he would consider a creative drought. (laughs) You know what I mean? Um, and, and so, you know, virtual self is his love letter to, to that sort of like online presence, the sort of like on, you know, it, it's, it's that, it's that total millennial twenties, you know, coming up in that era. Um, and, and that's very, that, that nostalgia is very like prominent in all of his music. And then, so nurture, when you get to nurture and, and the sort of maturation of his music and it's like mm-hmm. what he was struggling with during that time is like, what is my... I need something new to love, which Mm. is literally a lyric in, in one of his songs. I need something new to love. That's the thing that's missing. That's why I feel creatively stumped is because I don't have anything to write a love letter to. And so nurture became his love letter to the real world. Mm -hmm. It became his love letter to things like family. And it tackled like, um, it, it tackled his, grappling with self-doubt oh yeah and, oh my god um, that his, track mirror oh it's 
Oh my god, it's like that that track hits me like a freight yeah, train, man. That's the um, one that stands out for me just cuz, you know, I struggle so much with like feeling like the things that I'm doing or creating are are worthwhile and, you know, being your own worst critic. Um, sure, yes. It's it it hits so hard for me. And that that's definitely the standout track and and seeing an artist expressing that on their own album, I'm like, that's mm-hmm. next level for me. But but Adam, do you does it surprise you to then be getting that from an EDM song? Like it kind of does. I feel like it hit me more so because like or, or even more so I right. should say because I'm like not. I, like when I listen to some lo-fi music or instrumental music or whatever, you're painting pictures in your head. There's obviously lyrics to this music. There's lyrics to other EDM music, but it's usually more of a sonic thing and not actual. I don't want to say it's not substance, but that it's not as deep as what I w- I wasn't expecting that in this music. Right. And I'm listening to this and I'm like, oh no, there's all this that's painted and then there's all this that's being said and it's all like it's all starting to resonate then yes it just it took me by surprise i wasn't ready to i wasn't prepared i guess to like have that sort of lyrical uh aspect to it where it's like you're making me feel good and then you're jabbing me in the gut too at the same time (laughs) right with lyrics that you would you would expect from you know some some, singer song some guy with an acoustic guitar staring at his shoes yeah exactly (laughs) it 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 almost does hit harder because it's so unexpected and the the music behind it is so just masterfully created it feels um, like a soundtrack. I keep coming back yeah. to like it feels like a video game soundtrack. It makes sense that I mean, you mentioned Forza. Uh, has he been in other video games? Has he done anything else in that space? Starting with DDR, I wonder. Yeah, I you know I, I was joking about this on on Twitter the other day because he he released this um like little animated this short animated like teaser for um a little leg of the the nurture tour that he's doing around Halloween time and and it looked like. Um, a teaser like opening for a video game and I just sort of I'm like really it's only a matter of time before Porters makes a video game right like, I, I feel like that's next you know I feel like be. that has to be next um, but yeah he just like <laughs> he it, it's everything about the way he approaches his art and like the the work ethic behind it and yeah the relatability of the lyrics like uh, we were we were talking like me going full time and everything like his song musician. I, I'm not exaggerating when I say that like his song musician was what got me in that headspace of like oh, yeah? maybe this is what I need to do. Um, that song is all about grappling with like you know like like is this what I need to do? Like my gut's telling me that this is what I need to do, but can I make that leap? Mm-hmm. You know, and like the 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 driving kind of chorus of that song is it's calling. I just can't stop. I'm sorry. You know, wow. and and that's kind of where I'm at with it. It's like I this thing calls to me. I know this is what I need to be doing, and I can't stop doing it, regardless of everything, every voice in my head that's telling me not to, everything that's telling me. Like some of the lyrics in the song is like, you know, isn't it time you get a job? Isn't it time you just grow up? You know what I mean? And and what you come to realize is a lot of the album is him talking to himself, mm-hmm. you know, and him kind of having that dialogue back and forth with his own with with his own perspective mm-hmm, on things, mm-hmm. and um and musician was was that track where I was just like yeah like I need to start thinking about taking the plunge because because that's what it is it's a calling like the the phone is ringing and you choose to answer it you know and for for a song to to have that kind of like. Um, that that resonating quality I, I think is is super cool. I, I never I've never had that with like I've never had like a, a a song really just kind of make me like reevaluate things in my personal life. You know, yeah. I've had songs <laughs> that I've connected to, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but like that that hit it like just the right time. It kind of percolated in things that I was already thinking about. Wow. And it's like, you know, it, it just it just made perfect sense. It just felt so true. It feels his music feels so genuine and like raw and vulnerable to me that it, that I find so relatable and in, in, in the way I produce my own art. Just try to try to be as like genuine as possible because you never know when somebody's going to connect with it. Yeah, you know. Yeah, amazing. Um. Well, so I, I 
feel like my last question then is um you we've talked about like following his genesis um do you feel like there's an anticipation for what he does next and if so is it an anticipation of just wanting to experience it see what it is the unknown or is there a thing like i i'll say that's with some of my favorite artists when i hear they're doing a side project or a new something um i get a little nervous because i go into it with an expectation and i don't know if it's going to be what i want it to be um there are other artists that i'll just follow to the end of the earth you know like i i know that andrew mcmahon whatever he decides to do I'm there. I trust him. He's a fantastic pop writer. I just think that I, 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 no matter what, I'm going to be there. Um, and so it seems like the answer would be that, yes, you're going to go along with whatever he's, he's going to present for you or build for you next as a fan. But do you feel like you have expectations? Do you feel like there's a porterness that you're hoping to tap into? Do you want another nurture in the future? Like, can you that's, body another n- nurture in the man, future? <laughs> right. Yeah. That That's an interesting question because like, if, if you'd asked me that question before nurture came out, if you had been like, you know, what, what are you expecting from Porter's next album? Mm-hmm. Like I, I would have thought, you know, cause, cause worlds is really, like it's it's emotional and it has like that that kind of emotional vibe, but like nurture is like leaps and bounds in terms of just the maturity of the the lyrics. I mean, he sings on it for the first time really. Um in in worlds, he's like it's it's vocaloids and it's synthesizers, and like now he's finally comfortable to use his own voice and stuff. Yeah. And mm. um nurture feels like a real maturation that I could not have possibly predicted because right because he's grown as a person and he's come to like understand himself more as a person and as an artist. Um, and so not only am I like, I'll follow him to the ends of the earth and I'm just here for whatever he makes next, but I'm also like, it's going to be completely dependent on things in his own life that I'm, that I'm never going to know about. Is it like self discovery things in his own life? And, and that, that is going to 1000% change his sound. Yeah. And, um, just, just the way that like, I don't make podcasts. I don't write the same as I did, you know, even five years ago. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like we're, we're always as artists, we're always like growing and changing. And I think that Porter has a really interesting tactic too on the delivery of his music because he's very secretive. Like he does not tease or talk about like, Hey, I'm working on this or that. Like you don't hear it until it's done. You know, he'll release singles ahead of time and whatnot, but you don't, you don't hear like work in progress or little teases or whatever. He's like, when it's done, I'll talk about it, you know? So, um, so whatever comes next, I I mean, for me, it's like really hard to imagine me liking something from him more than nurture, Mm -hmm. but, um, but, but like, I'm totally I'm I'm here for the ride for whatever it is, you know yeah. what I mean? Man. And there's something to be said about the fact that you have this relationship now. I'm assuming there's thousands and thousands of other people who have also mm-hmm. built this relationship there. Um, and that trust, that connection is going to carry you with him through whatever it is. Because I do think that a lot of these artists, especially in the EDM space, um, but across the board feel the need to stay top of mind, feel the need to, there's a reason why those teases exist. Right. Um, right. I, I remember, I mean, there was a guy pretty lights who was like, I, I remember hearing about him all the time. I saw him live. It was really great. And I never heard from him again after a few years. And I don't know, I don't know where that guy is. Where's that guy? Like these, I feel like the moment that you fall off after a year or two, it's that much harder to climb back up into the space that you already were. It's interesting that Porter feels like he's in a space where he could just build what he wants, do what he wants. It's his it's his kind of palette to orchestrate, and he knows that people are going to go with him. And if they don't, like you said, he can live off of the royalties that he was going to get from some of those other songs. <laughs> but like, Literally. But it's amazing that he had, he's at under 30 years old, right, that he's in this space where he's got this group where he's just like, 
cool, let's go. I'm going to, I'm going to make for you and you engage with it. And we're all in this together and I don't need to be buzzy and sure you're going to nominate me for a Grammy. I am sure I'm going to headline this festival, but like, I don't have to do that to stay in your brain. I'm there when we're ready to do something. That's super well, special. And- yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and, and he has to make his art that way. I think to, to the, like that, that just is, is how it has to be for him for, for his creativity. But I also think that he's willing to, um, to take on the baggage, the emotional baggage that comes with that. I mean, the first real track on nurture is a song called look at the sky. Um, and it's a very kind of like, it's got that hooky. It's, it's his one more time. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, and and, and like it's in that song, even though it's a very hopeful, I'll be alive next year, you know, one of the first lines in the, in the verse of the song is like, are you close? Like, shouldn't it come to you naturally? You know, everyone knows you're losing your gift and it's plain to see, oh, you man. know what I mean? Oh my God. Like it's, it's stuff like that where it's like, Ooh. he's willing to take on those thoughts and that self doubt and all of the baggage that comes with the fact that he took seven years to make this album mm-hmm. yeah. because that's, that's part of the process. Like that's part of what makes him, him. It, he, he needs that in order to create the music he creates, you know, just the fact that he's so open about it too, that it doesn't really hide his struggles and, and almost seems to mm-hmm. thrive in being so vulnerable with it um is is something that's pretty amazing and inspirational so Mm -hmm. definitely now um you know having in even in such a short time connecting with uh a number of the songs on this album it it kind of does make me excited to see like what he's going to do next with the second full-length album being such a departure from the first um, and in such a unique avenue because you don't really see a whole lot of EDM artists singing on their own music. You know, you either get a guest to come in or it's all sample driven or there's just, it's just strictly instrumental, <clears throat> but you know, I'm, I'm definitely interested and you've, I'll just say that you've definitely expanded my mind like this. is. Oh yeah. <laughs> it definitely <laughs> sure. was not what I expected. Which, which is always good. It's always a good uh, to have your expectations shattered <laughs> uh, yeah. in such a in such an amazingly positive way. Um, but you know, at the same time, it's it's rare that I come across someone's art that truly makes me self reflect about my own art in such a profound way and the way that I approach creating whatever it is that I'm creating. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really been, and I'm, I'm still like, I'm just barely beginning to digest this. So I'm sure I'm going to get even more out of it as I continue to, to, to go deeper into repeat listens. Now you need to go see someone live. That's like we're gonna get you to Izu or Ultra <laughs> or something like that, dude. Those things go till five in the morning. Oh, they don't God. start till like nine or ten o'clock at night. The the Porter show was about four and a half hours. Yeah. Well, and yeah. so I'm reading too. He's got yeah. this. His newest project, I guess, is that Air to Earth. Um, yeah, it's a, apparently like a live only project. Um, very sample driven. And like really tranquil and ethereal. So that actually has me pretty, that, that sounds like something that's more up my alley. Um, so that he'll would do be some interesting. Stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. He'll, he'll every now and then he'll just, again, it's like that kind of side project, virtual self sort of thing. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I think too, and with, with some of the lyrics, we were talking about kind of the juxtaposition of like, you don't see lyrics like this mm. in EDM all the time. Like not only that, but like the, the songs are so well written on, on a lot of, on worlds too, but on nurture in particular, like there are little tiny lines that are just burned into my head because of the way they, they like affected me. There's um the song, something comforting on nurture has has the first line in the song is if i send this void away have i lost a part of me wow you know and like i think about that all the time and it drives home the the feeling of the album that i mean the title of the album is nurture 
because it drives into um, the whole concept of nature versus right. nurture, right? It is, you know, nature is the things that we can't control, the things that make us us that are outside of our control. But nurture is the things that brought us to be what we are. Mm. It's the things that happened to us that that made us who we are. Right. And that is what the entire album is about. It's the things that made him him, you know? Incredible. And then final question final thought if for someone that has you know the long haul listened to this entire episode and is still not sold but you have 30 seconds to sell them on porter robinson to get them to listen what's your pitch what do you say to them I would say to them, just just come in with an open mind. Um, you know, uh, I think nurture is probably more accessible than worlds um, b- because of all the relatable things we've been talking about. You know, go on Spotify, turn on nurture, and and just like let it let it go. Come in with a kind of open mind and open heart to it, and um, allow yourself to get to that kind of like real raw emotional place. And I mean, like I sent there. There's a track on that on that album called Mother. I sent it to my mom, mm. and. Like my mom doesn't give a crap about EDM. You know what I mean? Like she doesn't she doesn't relate to that at all. But she loved it. Like she loved oh, wow. it. She connected to the lyrics That's and amazing. everything. And and so I mean, I really do think that the themes of that album are are somewhat universal. You know, I think a lot of people can relate to it. And so I would recommend that. Just just turn on nurture and just like go with it. Just let it take you where it wants to take you. And if anybody's looking for uh, a suggestion for Seth for a Christmas gift, it looks like there is a double LP deluxe vinyl box yeah. set no. with a hardcover art book. It's lyric beautiful. Book, I would like, love to have it. Yes. A linen. It's made out of linen box set um, with all seven, all six singles on seven inch, and then opaque white double LP vinyl. Holy um, moly! looks very lovely um oh, it's beautiful i yeah. i don't know if i'd spring for that but i in listening to this album this is something that i would throw on a turntable like this uh, totally. talked about like what's a cd or or uh what's a cd album as opposed to what's a vinyl album for me and this is definitely a vinyl album this is you throw it on and you immerse yourself yeah yeah, hard to agree. Yeah, his music's really good about that. We, I was talking with, uh, we we had that ex- Dan and I had that exchange in the Discord the other day, mm-hmm. where Dan was was driving home from like a wedding he was covering. Oh, yeah. and he just he just had like this wild hair, I guess, to listen to Worlds and just like listen to that whole album on his drive home, and just and he he was like, dude, I, like I was floored, you yeah. know. Yeah. Um. So it's it's just it's that kind of album. Just like consume it and let it take you where it wants to take you. Yep. You know that's that's true of all of his stuff. Awesome, awesome, Seth. My goodness, sir. Thank you so much for coming on and just blessing oh. us with your presence and uh, your friendship and your this knowledge. Um, always, always, always welcome to come back and talk about any artist that you are stoked about. Uh, would be happy to have you on Um, really excited about the things that you have coming up Um, go check out all n podcast um, and related all n twitch channel twitter uh, all the good stuff Um, always an an amazing uh, you can always expect to have something amazing come across uh, your feed when you're when you're plugged into all n for sure one of my one of my favorite follows um, but thank you Thanks so much. Of man. course. Absolutely. Thanks for being on. And thank you listener for listening to retro groove. We are part of the retro logic network. You can find us on discord on the retro logic server. You can also find us on Twitter at retro groove underscore pod and Instagram at retro groove underscore podcast. And with that, we have wrapped up episode 23. Thank y'all so much for listening guys. We'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.